Uh, we started SEMA in November of 2018. And um, we, we um, today are 60 plus people. And so we are distributed globally, mostly in the Bay Area. And as you know, recently we started our site in Bangalore. So we have 66, 60 plus people. And to date, we have raised 40 million in capital. And um, our lead investors are Dell Technologies, Amplify Partners, and Wing. So those are three key uh, technology, or three key three VCs or investors. And uh, we are very excited at the market space that we focused in. And kind of I'm touching upon the second question, but to really maybe just answer the very first one, stop there, and then maybe you could clarify more for me in the second question is, the, if you look back in the past 10, 15 years, machine learning has played a very big part in reshaping the cloud. And, and, and I, I, I've joked that we used to print maps and really guide ourselves with maps. So you want to go from a Bangalore to a Mysore, you have to really go plot and figure out, okay, which road am I taking and where to go look to. Look at the shift that's happened to our lives where it's all Google Maps or Apple Maps today. And so the whole cloud experience has reshaped the way we think, reshaped the way we work today. For the next 15 to 20 years, the larger market is the edge. And I believe that machine learning is gonna play a very big part in reshaping everything at the edge. And today the edge sits on very old technology. It's 30 year old classic SOC technology, a system on a chip technology. And we wanted to be one of the companies that really brings machine learning in scale to the end better edge. So machine learning is not new. And I think like you highlighted, the need for robotics has always been there. The need for autonomous has always been there. The need for remote medical healthcare has always been there. But for the past 10 years, practically there has not been volume and scaling. So there's been a lot of hype around it, but it's not really happened. And that's at the very core of the problem we wanted to really uh, take care of is our primary focus is to build a purpose-built machine learning platform for the embedded edge. And we believe that that's a critical missing piece that's prevented the scaling of machine learning at the edge. And what we wanna do with it is really enable for our customers an opportunity to scale ML and make the journey easier so that they could really meaningfully drive a lot of adoption of machine learning at the edge. So that's the intent and the vision behind what we started the company at. Now it's been two years and we're getting very close to production. And this is, this is the year where we believe that I think machine learning is going to really pivot into going from a nicety and no doubt the pandemic has exacerbated this or accelerated this and it's shifted from a nice good to have to a really necessary element. We have three market priorities and a large category of our focus is smart vision. These are security, surveillance, health monitoring, retail safety, security applications. So uh, I'll talk you through the use cases and the value proposition of what we're enabling in that category, right? So that's one, smart vision. The second one is robotics and drones. And I'll talk you through also the use cases that we have, which are now beginning to get into scale. The third one is autonomous. Okay, so those are the three market categories. So in smart vision, there's broadly two categories. And if you take a step back, uh, the image capture used to happen in the cameras, but the analytics traditionally have always been on the cloud because that needs a lot of high, mission, high performance and the cloud was really the vehicle to really perform analytics in the cloud. And that's been the classic divide between capture and analytics. But in the last year, year and a half, for either security reasons or privacy reasons, and in the United States, particularly on racial bias reasons, the video, the cloud analytics is no, no longer going to be in the cloud. People do not want their data to be on the cloud. They want to embed all that intelligence right into the camera module. So this is a big shift that we are seeing across the globe. And this is now requiring very high performance ML to be embedded with the image capture in a very, very constrained thermal and power constraint. That's one key application that we see. We also see an application where people have deployed a lot of infrastructure 
But because of the pandemic, people want to really add a new capability to existing infrastructure. They want to add smart thermal scanners into security cameras. They want to add social distance monitors into security cameras. These again require a lot of high performance machine learning and they want to leverage the existing infrastructure, but really be able to create new applications, new capabilities with existing cameras. The, the third category of use cases we see is really around public safety and, and, and really ensuring that in high security areas, people are moving from just facial recognition and pattern recognition now into more complicated ML use cases where it's behavioral analytics. Are you a threat to the people around you? Are you really holding a book or are you holding a gun, right? So people want to be able to do a lot more predictive analytics and behavioral analytics in their camera module. All of this needs very high performance ML and this cannot be in the cloud. What we're seeing is, so no doubts, there's a well-established chain of integrators that sell into the deployment and the infrastructure and how to roll out security, surveillance, and safety infrastructures well in place. We are not reinventing the wheel. We are engaged with the existing suppliers and enabling them, but these are new products for them. And so we are working with them to really help them enable a new way to really go make this happen because software-based analytics cannot have the performance. People need a combination of a hardware software solution. So we are building new products, but the, the existing folks that I think we are working with. There are a lot of new players coming into it. We are also working with them directly too. Um, but in my mind, there's gonna be a refresh of how people have done security surveillance systems. And we see an overhaul of the infrastructure happening today. But succinctly, I think we are engaged with mostly the customers that are the incumbent market leaders today. We have a few innovators, but really I think we are not reinventing the wheel. We are working with them directly globally. Right? So, so, so that's, that's some of the, the, the security and the smart vision uh, customers, if you will. It's a blend, no doubts. I think for the use cases that I told you, these require new equipment and these require a overhaul of the hardware software. And so we are seeing benefits of it in North America and portions of Asia. Uh, but I think our stated priority, and we are still a startup. I mean, I should couch this. We still are a startup and we are still gaining customer traction. And I think our initial focus is in North America and portions of Asia. But as I think the deployments kick in globally, I think we will derive and we'll learn from what we are doing right now and what we could do different and better. But in my mind, I think it's a blend of both greenfield and existing markets. Robotics, again, it's a broad category of use cases that we see. Um, the area where we see the highest volume is really in factory floor automation and warehouse lo logistic robots. So that is really the area where we see the highest volume. There's a lot of other traditional robotic markets that we're also seeing a lot of interest in, but they have a little longer time to revenue and the volumes are lesser. But from factory floor logistic robots, they're using fairly old technology today where a robot is similar to a car in that it has a pathfinding algorithm and a human safety interaction environment that goes around it. We are seeing robotic infrastructure with 45 minutes shelf life where they can stay on the factory floor for 45 minutes, then they have to go back to the docking bay, recharge, and then get back on the factory floor. We are showing customers how to do that six to eight hours uninterrupted based on our technology. And so that's a huge TCO, total cost of ownership. And it also is a huge available time that I think is a big economic benefit to our customers. So that's another shift that we're seeing. And, and this is also something that the pandemic has exacerbated. People want to try and minimize as much human machine interface as much as possible. They definitely want to get productivity. And this is not just in North America. This is everywhere globally. No doubt there are a few key leaders in North America that are pushing quite a bit of technology with us. But we're definitely going to be seeing this trend across the board. And in my mind, robotics has definitely gone beyond the POC stage. And so, so we've been observing the market for 10 years where 
It's been nascent innovation with very low volume and proof of concepts. But we now see significant volumes that are kicking in across the globe. And not only are a few big companies getting into this, but there's a lot of innovation, a lot of startups, a lot of companies where you're beginning to focus on robotics. And on drones, it's a similar use case in that now, and there's a wide range of drones from industrial drones to high-end consumer drones. And we are enabling a similar value proposition in that we are now able to, because of a key technical merit for us is we are 20x better than anybody else on a key technical merit called frames per second per watt. So which really translates to how much can we compute for a given time, given power budget. And because of that unique capability combined with our software strength, we can now enable people to do a lot more compute for a lot less power. And that in a drone environment, you can imagine is again shifting 20 minute available flight time to more than two hours. So a lot more can be done, a lot more can be managed. And we definitely see now delivery drones coming in, in into a big way. And so the next two years, I think we're gonna see a lot of delivery drones. We're gonna see obviously a lot of security drones that really come in. And the FAA in the US is just commissioned and, and permitted for drones. And there are new rules and regulations that are kicking in. So I talk about scaling you need a legal regulatory infrastructure also to be approved for these things to scale, right? So because of the volume scaling, the regulatory elements, people are now beginning to deploy that. And just to complete my thought there is really to ensure that the available time for the drones is much longer than before, but there also could be night vision capability that they could not do before in these so that you would deliver during the night. It, it already is a challenge and it's gonna be an even bigger challenge going forward, no doubts. But I think th there's, a, th there's a backhanded validation in this in that because the volumes are there, the regulation's happening, right? So if the, the volumes were not there, there's no need for regulating anything at all, right? <laughs> so, so the mere fact that governments are beginning to think about regulation and is because now I think to the point of the hype cycle that we have had for the past 10 years of possibility, there was really no need to regulate any of it, right? But the mere fact that now people are seeing a dire need for it and people need drones, people need robots, people need better smart vision systems, there is no doubt regulation to it. But this isn't new for us. I mean, I'm going back to my previous company. We have lived with the regulatory bodies. And, and, and so no doubt it's going to bring new complexity. But it's a fairly um, well-understood element of how to go about the compliance. And so we obviously are focused on a few markets today, to your point. Each country is probably going to pick a new infrastructure and a new means to go look to. And we'll definitely be respectful of everybody's regulatory need, but we'll put a process in place and we'll understand the system. And the other benefit is we are not doing this unilaterally. We have an ecosystem of customers and us jointly go navigate and co-regulate and co-certify the products. So I think the autonomous industry has done a good job with this. And there's a lot of learning I think we're going to drive. And we have folks like Amit and Sudarshan that are in India that have gone through the certification with a lot of other products with different markets. So I'm sure we're going to have a learning curve. I'm sure it's going to be more complicated than today. Both in North America and Europe, delivery drones are really beginning to now scale. And it's still low volume. I mean, it's in the tens of thousands, if you will. But from zero to tens of thousands, this is a very, very big shift. Yeah, so so that's, that's one area. Factory floor logistic robots, this is now happening in North America and Europe. <clears throat> and, and we are beginning to see a good ramp up of it in Japan and South Korea. But we definitely are beginning to see, I think I, in my mind, if we were to meet again in a year, I think we'll now be looking at these markets well represented with volume. And now the other geography is really picking it up. But I'm talking to you about what I believe are the folks that have, I think, really deployed in a significant way. And at this stage, we have not engaged with China yet. And, and, and so I cannot speak for the market in China, but I'm sure that there's a lot of activity happening on all these within China as well. But from a regulatory focus, I think we want to really win and establish ourselves with North America, 
and Japan and South Korea. And there's a lot happening in India as well. And we are now beginning to understand the India market. What are the needs of the India market? And I'm sure it's going to be different than the other geographies. But the fundamental capability is something that we truly meaningfully want to scale. And we're going to learn from, <clears throat> from, from Amit and Sudarshan on the needs of the India market. And could we be doing something there with local leaders? Do we have to adapt our product line so it fits the needs of the India market better for any of these applications? So part of our having our site in India is not just for the development alone. I think we want to really also understand the India market or maybe the markets around India and see, could we enable people to do things differently? And I'm sure every market has its own wrinkle. Every market has its own need. And at the stage we are in, we are learning and we have a steep learning curve. And, and Ahmed comes from Daimler and Sudarshan has been with quite a few companies recently with On Semiconductor and Aptina. And I'm sure they've adapted for their existing product, I mean, companies' products to the needs of the Indian market. Those are also the other opportunities we'll be looking at. In regards to scaling machine learning, I mean, there is a lot of talk around machine learning, but the number of people that really understand it is a small subset. And that's been my learning in the last 20 years is talk is cheap, but the number of people that actually know it, that do it, it's a very small percentage. So we've been very lucky to scale our team in really being able to attract those talents. So finding those good people, is, it's always hard, but now it's harder. And we have joked that we have gone from 20 people to 60 people in the last year. But attracting talent is a very key element of who we are. And we've been very lucky to attract our talent. And we also know that North America is not the only geography where the talent is. So we have folks today in Europe, and now we are starting our site in India. We want to be able to tap into the limited few that actually know machine learning and are capable and have the skill set to really groom and grow this. So in the immediate term, we are really wanting to make sure that we get access to the talent, not only in development, but also folks that can work with our customers. And as a startup, we already have 10 people that are specialists in working with our customers because our customers need help too. So it's not about just development, but it's really about helping our customers understand our technology, deploy the technology. And so we have brought on folks that have a strong systems background and understand our customers' problems and understand how to really scale our technology to fit into the customer side. Longer term for ML to really scare, we, we really need to have ML scale in the universities. And in my mind, the programs in the universities globally are very academic. And, and, and it's very, I mean, machine learning, if you really look deep into it, it's nothing more than math. So math has been around forever. Mm -hmm. and, and we've just now really embraced it in the context of machine learning and really deploying it in scale. But in my mind, the education system, the internship, the training programs that we have is still very uh, academic. And sure. it's, it's a big learning curve for somebody to get out of school and directly be able to work on a production program that really is going to go meaningfully scale. So, but, but, but if you go back, all technologies have the same herky-jerky start. Everybody talks about it. There's no volume, and 10 years later, maybe there's a prudent adoption of it. And I think Gartner calls this the hype cycle. Right? So, so we are going through the same thing. But now I see a pragmatic scaling that really is happening. And timing is everything. And no doubts, uh, the pandemic has accelerated the need for all of these, like I think we talked about. But I think over time, people will figure out how to get the right collective talent globally, like we are. Um, and people will learn that I think the universities really have to now create people that are tuned for the needs of the real market versus really academic elements. <clears throat> and that's the journey that I think we are going to go through. But we are a young company, and, and we know that we don't need to solve all the problems today. <clears throat> Neither can we solve all the problems today. So we just need to solve the problems we can address today and do a good job at it and say, okay, and I, one of my previous CEOs used, used to tell me is one of the benefits of solving problems today is you get to solve problems tomorrow. If you don't solve the problems today, then there's no need to solve the problems for tomorrow. So, so we're taking a 
one step at a time. We are involved in solving two key challenges right now. One is to get our product to production so that we can scale with all customers. Number two, that we help some of the best customers in the world really get to production. So those are the two problems that we are focused on today. So I grew up in Bangalore. And so, so it's home for me to be able to um, step back into Bangalore and start the site. And, um, and, and even with my previous employers, we have had quite a big footprint in India. And, and, and Xilinx has a large design center or, or a site in um, Hyderabad. So uh, to me, as we looked at what we needed to get done, India has a rich talent pool in almost everything that we're doing on hardware design, on software design, on firmware, BIOS, operating systems, systems bring up. And, and I think over the last 10 years, India has also gained a lot of experience in systems, not just around development of individual aspects of technology, but bringing it all together and solving applications. <clears throat> we, wanted also, we also recognize that access to talent is really gonna be a key gap and end of the day, companies defined by its people, the strength and the quality of the people that we have. We did not want to be a company that's unilaterally in North America or in Europe. We really want to have a global footprint. And for us to win and compete in the market globally, we definitely need our people to be deployed globally. And India is a very logical choice in what we picked. We're starting small. I think um, Amit's heading our software efforts, Sudarshan's heading our hardware efforts. And we're starting small there. I think we'll be around 20 people, I think, very soon. But we have big ambitions for a site in India, and we really want that to grow. And I think it's going to be more than development. We are going to be doing systems applications and a lot of other key things, either for the Indian market or for outside over there. So Amit Sudarshan, do you want to add to it? Um, yeah, I think I think it's a, it's a one of the, the uh, there was a, a very logical choice to have a center in India. There is uh, no second question about it because uh, you name a, um, any big semiconductor industry, tire ones or OEMs, you know, uh, technical service providers, you have all the ecosystem that you need is right here in the Bangalore. So it's, it's, it's completely a, the best choice that you can think about in having a center here. And of course, um, uh, the access to the talent pool is something which is, which is very, very uh, dynamic. Okay. And, uh, <clears throat> Uh, that's uh, the whole. Um, uh, it's it's and when you talk about uh, technologies, machine learning and computing, there's a there's there's a huge uh, there's a huge uh, hype about it, of course. But people are also interested to learn and adapt into it very quickly. So when we are talking to the people here, interviewing you know hundreds of people, we see them people here. They know they know they know a little bit, but there's a gap which we see as we can fill up, and then we try to help them. Okay, so we see there's a lot of excitement. They want to be into it, and and they are into it in one or other way, looking into you know different uh, semiconductor industries. They have been doing it, but yeah. Now the question is, you know, this is the time where we can pull all this together and you know completely take a chance to reinvent this whole edge computing apart, edge computing as such. So that's that's something really uh, yeah. helps us a lot to build a center in India, and definitely it's one of the best choices of you. We have the plan. Right. That's the plan. Once the production happens, we will have the a team here. As Krishna suggested, there will be a business uh, application support team who will work from here and who will be supporting the customers in different uh, um, time zones to help them, you know, make their application, understand their application, support it into their, you know, uh, understand our technology and adapt it better way. Take the legacy applications, help them. How the uh, the complete ML and AI solution that we are trying to do the low power low power edge and endpoint AI solution requires uh, expertise in multiple domains, which is the not just the ML AI that's the front end there, but then it uh, involves the computer architecture, the computer vision, SOC design, and on the software side compilers, drivers, firmware and systems, and all of them have to come together to provide a solution here. And then so it's, uh, so. Yes, the ML AI probably is, is just a nascent field that we are just get, people are just uh, graduating and uh, building up the skills. But there's so many other talents that are required to make a system here. So, and then India has an excellent uh, talent pool in all these domains. And as uh, Amit was saying, I did a survey in my previous company on how, what percentage of uh, employees, global employees, uh, uh, that is based out of India in my major multinationals like uh, Intel's or um, 
Qualcomm, NVIDIA, if you look at that, on an average, you can say about 10% of the workforce of all the major MNCs are in India. It's not uh, gone are the days where people come to India because of the low-cost geography. It's not that's the case. That's the case is people are here because of the talent availability. And then there's a constant replenishment of this uh, um, talent pool. Like every year, we have nearly uh, 250,000 plus engineers that come out of the uh, various schools here. So, and then we, as I said, this solution requires multiple domains, and then we have got uh, a good amount of uh, resources coming every year. And there's there's a opportunity to go organically. So this is one great advantage that every MNC is looking for, and I think that's what we are trying to you know, use up in, in for SEMA also. So it's an exciting opportunity for us to be actually participating in this cutting edge technology and provide more opportunities for uh, ML and AI engineers to participate and um, really exciting times indeed. From a leveraging technology partnerships in really getting into production, we have three key technology partners. One is, and we have been public about it, one is ARM Technologies. So our processing compute capability, we are leveraging their IP and their capabilities, and we have a very strong partnership with them, and we are very happy with that. From a computer vision, EDA, IP tool infrastructure, we also have a strong partnership with Synopsys. And so part of the reason why 60 people can do what we're doing is because they're very heavily uh, partnered with us and helping us significantly in our journey. So both ARM and Synopsys really are very strong technology partners. We will be fabricating our product with TSMC, and we definitely also have a very strong partnership with them. So from a technology partnership, we feel like we are in very good hands with these three industry leaders. And as you know, I think all three of them are leaders in their field. I mean, Synopsys and EDA and IP, uh, ARM and processor subsystems, and TSMC is the largest um, independent uh, um, in, in the world. And so we feel we are in a really good place. And as it comes to leveraging, I think you talked about Intel or Qualcomm, we actually compete with them. True. So, 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 so what we are building in many ways competes with them. So uh, I have many good friends there. We have uh, great stories to exchange, but unfortunately from a business perspective, we compete with them. And so we, um, uh, are careful in how we manage those relationships. And so what we're building is definitely exciting to all these different companies, and I'm sure they're tracking what we're building. But what we build is competitive, and so we are careful in who we technology partner and who we don't. So that answers the first part, part of the question. And I think you had questions on Israel. And so Israel's always been a very fascinating space for me. Um, and there's many parallels between Bangalore and Israel. I mean, it's very, very similar, very smart, very capable, very driven, very motivated people. And there's a strong startup innovation culture in Israel. And we absolutely are engaged with many market leaders in Israel. So we, we definitely already are. Uh, we are not at liberty to mention names of customers. But we, I can tell you that I think either from a development perspective or from a customer perspective, um, our teams are engaged with them on a weekly basis. And, and, and we are very excited at what our technology can bring to the Israel market. And many of the market leaders there on smart vision or on robotics or including autonomous are now beginning to really look at our technology and how they can deploy it in production. So as we are navigating through our development, we're also simultaneously thinking about our customers and on-ramp. And I think one of the market complexities at the edge, unlike the cloud, is that we have tens of thousands of customers and so many geographies. And so bringing our technology to scale is a very um, uh, different problem than in the cloud, if you will, where it's really seven customers and it's really more targeted. And, and machine learning is also new. And, and, and we really have a software-centric approach that makes the ease of use and the adoption easier. But winning with all these customers is a long road and a long journey. And so mode the marketing and the business development and the sales and the support infrastructure is something that we're giving a lot of thought to. Um, I had a great experience learning this at Xilinx. And that company too, that's exactly the same challenges is 15,000 plus customers. And how do you really bring this technology to all of them and scale, but also run a good business where you're building scale and self-sufficiency with these customers as we manage. 
So at the stage that we are in, I think our first goal is to win the first 10 customers. And that's really direct engagement. And what's really needed is a lot of technical systems knowledge. We have a few business development people, but what we need is a lot of systems expertise and knowledge. And we're also tapping into our knowledge base. And Amit's been in the industry in automotive for a very long time. So we are leveraging our engineers to really help our cause. And that's kind of really the technical innovation we need today. Similarly, Solution has a strong background in smart vision and ML. So we're going to be leveraging not only our system solutions crew, but also our business development people and also our R&D people in winning the first 10. And then it goes to 50, where I think we now need more of a marketing infrastructure and a business development infrastructure. For the winning the first 10 and 50, I think it's really still going to be mostly a direct interaction with the customer. But once we go beyond 50 into 100 and 1,000, now we need to figure out a relationship with representatives of the company. And we need to figure out a distribution war relationship where now it's really around working with the arrows or the avenues of the world and how they can be trained so how they can take our technology and deploy it and build a multiplicative effect. And so these are journeys for us over the next year or two. And as I told you, I think now it's really around get our production, product to production, win our first 10 customers. So, so that's really the state that we're in. But we have obviously gone through this journey before, and I helped my previous companies build out a long-term infrastructure to really scale so we can bring and scale and bring these technologies to everybody and globally. And as you know, Japan's a very different market than India is a very different market and South Africa is very different. And so each one has its own wrinkle, but luckily there's established means in which you can deploy and get into a new place. And we'll definitely be tapping into it. And I'm sure there's adapting that we have to go do to go make that happen. But I think the scaling effort is really to get to the first 10 and 50 customers now. And that's our thinking right now. But once we get beyond that, we, we will be tapping into a good infrastructure to get into the best hands and the customers and all these jobs. It needs to be managed carefully, but we are not too worried about it because in, in reality, if you take a step back, the edge applications today are serviced by well-established companies. So multi-billion dollar companies, right? Whether it's Dialynx or TI or NXP or Qualcomm or Intel, they've all found a balance in the right kind of support with the right commercial infrastructure, right? And so these are all very profitable companies as well. Uh, but they're servicing this with, from my perspective, old technology. And so no doubts, we are bringing in an infrastructure to really deploy and replace that. But the support infrastructure of it is really very pivotal. And one key thing makes a difference of how many people you need versus not, which is software experience. If your software is really easy to use, and if people can get into more of a self-managed mode, then your support infrastructure becomes dramatically less. If your software is really complicated and really difficult to use, then you need an army of people for every custom, right? So, so we have inherited this outlook day one into what we are doing. It's both by architecture and construction and scaling, we know that software is the most important thing for us to do not only for the ease of use, because our customers are still on a steep ramp on adopting ML. If ease of use is not there, it's gonna be hard. From a support perspective, we cannot put an army behind every customer. So again, ease of use is really the most important thing. So we have really embraced a software-centric customer experience. And, and we have to thank Amit. And Amit was a customer for us a few months ago. And, and he, he, he was with Daimler and he taught us how important software is. And, and so we have learned from that and he got so excited that he decided to join us. And so we are very excited to have Amit be a part of our team. But software scalability and software ease of use at the very core, not only has a direct correlation to scalability and adoption, but it also has to your point, the element of commercial self-management and how could we really ma meaningfully manage? It's, none of these challenges are easy. And if somebody tells you that any of these are easy, uh, they don't know what they're talking about. All these are hard problems, but luckily I think these are not new problems. 
but no doubt. So I think we will have to innovate around these as a company. But I think I feel good about our software scalability and our approach that we have taken. And that should give us a better shot at not only scaling because we're purpose built, but also to manage the commercial support infrastructure need. I have joked that I have only four problems. So <laughs> one is we need to build an amazing product. We need to have amazing customers. We need to have amazing talent and we need to have amazing investors. I have only four problems. <laughs> and, so, and I can vouch for the fact that those will remain my four problems for the next 12 to 24 months. So I don't need to think very hard about what my four problems are. We feel very good. We have worked very hard over the last two years to get into this position of strength. And now it's about being paranoid, putting our head down every day, continuing to do these four things really well. And, and so I think no doubts uh, we are well-funded. And so I think we'll think about the funding when we need it later. We're also well-staffed for Gen 1. So I would say that the highest priority for us is to get to production when with the first few customers. So that's the awesome. highest priority. I have 30 years experience in industry, and I thought that the pandemic is really going to hurt us. And as I look at where we are now, it really has not. And it comes down to people and their resiliency and their ability to adapt. Uh, I'm amazed that we have hired more people in the company during the pandemic that we have never met. We're all working on a very complicated program in different geographies. Life is fine. You know, and, 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 and productivity has been very high and people are very motivated. And uh, I definitely was very worried at the start of the pandemic that it will really impact our ability to build a good product and production. But I think we have found ways to really keep ourselves focused. And not only us, I think take any company. It's really amazing. And, and today, the big shift is the reliance on new technology to manage the new normal has really become, I think, a necessity. So people are innovating around the constraint. People are building around the problem. And people are saying, okay, so we have a pandemic, we need to get to production, how do we do it? So that's been the mindset versus saying, oh my God, this cannot happen. I think people um, have really been able to do, so, so what used to be traditionally people being in a room to get done, fundamentally people have innovated around how to do it remotely. Right? So product development is now entirely remote and, and we have people globally everywhere working together we have adapted our program management and how do we stitch all of this together to be all remote. Uh, we have figured out how to be good engineers in the web versus really in a room writing on a whiteboard and really solving technical problems. We've also learned how to work with our technology partners, whether it's ARM or Synopsys or TSMC in getting them to provide us with the infrastructure, but also get into production. And, and I would say that in this case, it's not just us alone. I think the whole industry is really adapted how to go work. And the question I'm thinking through is in six, nine months, hopefully, I think life trends to becoming a little more normal like life used to be. Question is, will we go back? <laughs> will, will we go back to the way we used to work before? Or are we going to adapt to some other new normal? So I think uh, today I don't sit with the intelligence to predict any of the future. All I know is we are here today and this is where we need to get to and how do we get there? And so people are really adapting the workflow, the processes, the engagement models. And, and, and I think in pragmatic areas, they're figuring out how to be in a room together, socially distanced, so we can get the right few things done. Uh, but but I, think, I think to answer your question, we have adapted. We have not slowed down or changed anything. And in some pockets, actually, uh, the productivity has increased because we are working from home. And, and we are now also recognizing that we necessarily do not need to be in one room to get something done. And so, so that's also a new learning that's come out of all of this. Yeah. So I, I, I miss my friends. I wish I could fly to Bangalore and have coffee with Amit and Sudarshan. And, and I'm a very people person. And so this is all strange times for me. But we are coping. We are doing well so far, and and but this year is a very exciting year for us, absolutely. And so, so we have internally a concept of a ten x, and and that's the aggressive goal that we have taken us. Whether it's power savings or 
reduction in bomb cost or total cost of ownership or available time or 10x in machine learning complexity. But each one of these applications, we have very tangible economic and or technical merits that we want to be able to pass on to our customers. And in each situation, whether it's smart vision or autonomous or in robotics, and as an example, in autonomous, I think, which we didn't t- expand upon, today it's two and a half, three kilowatts people are spending on L4, L5 autonomous systems. We want to be able to reduce it to less than 100 watts. And, and you could look at the economic benefit of it. And so we have very granular understanding and also goals for us. And our customers are very excited at how much of a shift we can make in thinking. So if you're at less than 100 watts, you don't need thermal cooling and you don't need a whole lot of uh, infrastructure. I think you people are beginning to think that they need, right? So we want to reshape people's thinking of what's possible. And we have very aggressive, tangible goals for us beyond TCO. But, but each application, it's different. 